Uh, we're going to move on to our, our, our next speaker, uh, who's a, uh, a federal government defense project manager and also a published author. But in addition to those two fantastic titles, she's also someone who has uh, kidnapped a uh, deployed surveillance team to do her bidding. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together to Sarah Adams. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me here today. Um, I'm the one talking about, I guess, the one controversial topic of this whole event, Benghazi. <laughs> um, the way I'm going to do it today is, as you've seen, I wrote a book. Me and my co-author, Dave Boom Benton, um, he's famous from 13 Hours. We actually have done our own personal investigation um, to identify the actual terrorists at the attacks. But since we have such a good mix of people here today, I thought, let's just focus on being in a crisis and what happens in a crisis and the data that comes in during a crisis. So we're just going to walk through the timeline and just talk about the data that came in and maybe better ways that could have been used. And I'm not even going to explain things. We're almost going to go through it like it's just going on in real time, like if something just happened here and people came through the doors, right? So at 9.42 PM in Benghazi, and this is only 3.42 in the afternoon in Washington, DC. So whenever people say this happened in the middle of the night here, I don't know where any of that comes from. So it's, it's afternoon in Washington, DC. Um, the CIA annex, I'm, I'm from the CIA, so they get a phone call and saying, hey, there's an attack over here at the consulate. Um, the really interesting thing is it was a call, and then when the call came in, someone like radioed his team, like, team, come and meet, and they're like, okay, we'll go meet. It's like 10 at night, and then he got annoyed they didn't move quick enough, and um, he's like, no, get here now, and then they walk out and hear noise, like, oh, there's an attack. It's like, why did you not just say over the radio, hey, there's an attack? So obviously, first mistake, right? No sort of alerting system. You know, there's a person in the um, consulate calling a bunch of people. Let's just do an alert system. It gets sent out to everyone. So through this um, presentation, I'm using a tool called, it's by Met Metis Analytics. I, I just picked this tool because you could be sitting like in your office and input stuff, but also like teams on the ground can like wear it on them and get some of these alerts. So obviously, they could have gotten alert quicker than the whole weird radio game. Um, so just showed you what that looked like. And then basically, you know, what happens next is the teams load up all their gear. The times you're going to see in my presentation are basically taken off the surveillance videos at either the CIA annex or the US consulate, just FYI, where these actual numbers are coming from. So the team loads up in vehicles. Obviously, some of the big questions they have, right, is they're going to save the ambassador. He's, He's the, the person who matters the most in any country um, if you're overseas. So it's where's the ambassador located? They, they luckily knew he w went to bed for the night, so they knew where he was. But obviously, the other things that would have been interesting to know, as you can imagine, is who's with him, <laughs> right? They didn't know who was even in the building with him. So you know, saying, hey, he's in the building with two other people. The funny part is, is um, the buildings are gone now, so that's why there's points on dirt. So just FYI, two of the buildings from the consulate no longer exist anymore in imagery, and I didn't want to be weird and put in fake imagery. Um, so then we get the location of basically the two agents who work in Benghazi all the time that aren't with the ambassador, and then two people came with the ambassador. So it's sending those geocords too. None of these geocords were sent. These people, they moved to these locations within the first few minutes and stayed there for an hour. It would have been really good for the rescue teams, obviously, to know where everyone was on the compound. It would have sped up a lot of their response time. Another thing that really that happened is they asked, are the gates breached? The consulate was very simple. There was a gate at the front, gate at the back. That's it. So the attackers all came and attacked from the front. A couple like little miscreants were like, hey, I'm not going to do the attack Al-Qaeda wants me to do. I'm going to steal a land cruiser today. So a couple guys go straight to the back of the compound, get the keys. So obviously one had worked on the compound um, and drive the land cruiser. Out. And the funny thing is, is you could clearly they work there because they locked the gate. Um, the sad part is, in real time, as you can imagine, it got reported the back gate is breached. It did, nobody circled back around and said it was breached for like a minute, and then they relocked it, and now there's no terrorists there. So the problem, you know, if you would have said it was temporarily breached, the team actually would have gone to the back gate because all of Al Qaeda was at the front gate. So you know, it's just one of those little things. If you would have got the update, and they saw it on camera in real time. So we're at 10.05 now. Um, we're not going to discuss controversies here, but there's a lot of leaders in this room, OK? You can collect the best data in the world. You can hire the best talent in the world. 
But if you have a crappy boss, which was the chief of base in Benghazi, your team sits in a car for 19 minutes and doesn't get in the fight. It's factual. This is when they leave. People always ask if the movie's accurate. This is from the movie. They're only off by five minutes, so not too bad. So remember the Mercedes. Because we didn't just find the terrorists, we also found our belongings, because the US government seems to be better at charging people looting, um, which you'll learn. Our only terrorist in our attack was charged for looting, um, basically. Um, so three minutes later, these compounds are super close to each other. So at three minutes, they get up to basically the main roadblock blocking entrance to go to the main entrance of the compound. So they get out of their vehicles, and there's some terrorists running the checkpoint, and they have a whole negotiation, let us through, let our vehicles through. And he's like, hey, I got to call these Ansel Sharia guys to get passage for you to go through. So obviously, if you're using this tool back, you know, this is all getting reported over the radio. It's kind of like, who's Ansel Sharia? And so we pull that up. And, you know, since I found all the attackers, I got everybody's photos, so that'll be fun. <laughs> um, so basically, you, you pull up in real time if you're sitting on the CIA annex, just so you know, hey, who are we interacting with over here at the consulate? And you find out, oh, there's three Ansel Sharias in the area. Um, all actually were involved in our attacks. We're not going to spend too much time on terrorists today, but just to go through them so people understand, Mohammed ran the Benghazi branch. He knew bin Laden back during the Sudan days. Very long relationship. Sufyan Ben Kumu, a lot of people know him. He was a Guantanamo Bay detainee. He worked for Bin Laden's company in Sudan. He fought in Afghanistan. We'll come back to Mouse. That's Sufyan's um, deputy. I didn't make up the name Mouse. That's what the terrorists say. But you have to admit, that looks really good. Um, like, I was like, yeah, it does look like a rat or a mouse. <laughs> and then, he, so they ran the Darna branch, which was just a city east of Benghazi. Saifullah ran the Tunisia branch. He's a terrorist. Everybody knows and nobody knows him. So for all of us that look around my age in the room, if you remember two days before 9-11, when obviously Al-Qaeda did the um, attack against um, Ahmed Shah Massoud, right? So they were going to do 9-11. They're like, hey, let's take out the key US ally in Afghanistan. They sent in two suicide bombers pretending to be press. Those are his two Tunisian suicide bombers. So it's still all the same guys 20 plus years later being involved in terrorist attacks. So obviously, they don't convince Ansel Asharia to let them have, go down with the vehicles. So they break into three teams at the checkpoint, and they're like, OK, we're going to go different directions into the consulate you know, to get at the attackers. So the team that just starts to go straight down the road, all the terrorists are in front of them, so it becomes a really big gunfight. And so what they do is the first thing that happens is they shoot a grenade launcher just towards the big group of Al-Qaeda at the main gate. Um, that scares everyone in Al-Qaeda, and they all run off the compound. That's it, one shot. Um, so the crazy part is, so it's all on camera, and everyone in the State Department inside knows it. They watch the camera. And like, oh my gosh, all these attackers are leaving. So three minutes later, the, the State Department guy peeks out, right? He's like, did that really happen? And he goes out the door and he looks down like, oh my god, all the terrorists are gone. They don't radio and tell CIA, hey, all the terrorists have completely left every inch of this compound. So CIA is still like climbing over walls and nearby compounds and clearing random buildings they never needed to clear. So CIA doesn't actually. You don't see a foot on surveillance camera till 10.30. So they just now waste another 16 minutes trying to make their way onto an empty consulate because information wasn't shared. So now we just get to a point in the timeline. So let's just say we're at 10.30. So everyone now is on the consulate. And as you can imagine, the key focus is finding the US ambassador. There was a fire starting at, at his, on his villa about 10 PM. So now they're going in and out of his villa looking for him. And they do that till about 11 PM. And then 11 PM, another attack starts on the consulate. The funny part is nobody knows really who it is. Al Qaeda has left. Um, they thought maybe in real time it was friendly. So they're like, we got to be careful who we shoot. This could be like a response force. So, so, so a battle goes on like 10 or so minutes. And finally, a drone comes over the top of the console, the famous drone everybody's heard about that really didn't do anything. It was like a camcorder, right? So 
The night of the attacks, the drone was over in the city of Darna. It's a city to the east. It was collected on, on Kumo. Remember we saw him, the Gitmo guy? So they, they move it over. It takes about an hour to get there. Um, but you know, one of the things, if you're an analyst in station, right, you're like, hey, we got a drone now. We can maybe collect who's around the area. We've hopefully collected a little bit on you know, the idiots who brought their phones to the terrorist attack, which was pretty much everybody. Um, so, so, oh no, there we go. So in real time, everybody, here's eight guys who come up, right? Real time, so don't let the US government tell you otherwise. Okay, we had eight terrorists on the screen. Seven of these terrorists were attackers at the consulate. Six of these terrorists were Al-Qaeda, and one's Ansel Sharia, which makes sense. The US government, when captured, the one guy who was not an attacker and told you he was the mastermind. So Ahmed Abu Qatala, during the Libyan revolution, he ran like a militia with, he, he, he lived in a really crappy neighborhood, think Compton in its heyday. The neighborhood was actually called Kandahar, that was the joke. So him and 20 guys from Kandahar had a little militia during the revolution, and like a lot of the small militias that didn't really gain any kind of power, it disbanded after Gaddafi fell. So by late 2011, it disbanded, and he was mostly working every day on his construction site. He's apparently a very good builder. He's not good at anything terrorist-wise. <laughs> so because he's a little bit of a loose cannon, Al-Qaeda and Ansar Sharia told him nothing about the attacks. So he's at home sipping tea, and gets a call from a couple of the guys from his militia back in the day, because they've now joined Ansar Sharia and other terrorist groups, and they're like, hey, we're down at the US consulate, come down, Al Qaeda's attacking. And he's like, no way. <laughs> so he goes down to the consulate, but it's even funnier. He hangs out outside until Al Qaeda leaves. Um, so, yeah, so that's anyway, this is the US mastermind. He got 22 years in prison in the US justice system. He's a terrorist but he should be in Libya, charged for an assassination he did, and he'd have the death penalty. But, so we won't, so, so again, Al-Qaeda, 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 Ansar Sharia, Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda, Al-Qaeda. So let's talk about someone on the screen that actually matters. We'll talk about Omar. Um, because the US is horrible at collecting real names, they call him Abu Musab al-Mansur al-Libi. <laughs> but his name's Omar Shalali. He is the, the night of the attacks, and the CIA knew this person the night of the attacks, he was the AQIM, so that's Al-Qaeda's North African branch. He was their leader for all of Libya. He arrived at the attacks at 9 o'clock and led the entire attack on the ground, right? So the AQIM leader for Libya is on the ground leading the attacks, and they don't even tell you AQ's there, and their leader for the whole country is there. So. Omar is a very interesting guy. I'll go really quick um, because there's just there's a lot of historical stuff. He grew up in a house with seven brothers and three cousins. Yes, it took me a very long time to realize there was three cousins. So I was like, why are there so many men? Ten of them all went and fought in Iraq. Five of them died in Iraq. His brother Adele was super, super famous in Iraq. After they came back to Libya, they had all been friends with the leader of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. He also founded ISIS, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi. Zarqawi gets killed. His brother Adele is like, well, I'm going to go back and avenge his death. I'm going to go back to Iraq and blow some Americans up. He goes back, gets captured. The night of 9-11-12, Adele's on death row in um, Iraq. So if people aren't aware, this operation by Al-Qaeda was not to go kill Americans. It was to go capture the US ambassador and to swap him for terrorists. One of the most important terrorists they were going to swap him for is Adele al shalali Obviously, he didn't get swapped, and he met his maker in Iraq. Um, so now we go to basically, it's been so long that they're like, if the ambassador is in the building, he unfortunately must have died of smoke elimination. We found Sean Smith. He's deceased. They really, though, thought, because the terrorists shot out some of the cameras, they really thought maybe they just grabbed him and we missed it. So everyone decides to leave the compound. The first thing that happens is State Department goes and leaves. Um, the CIA says, don't go X direction because there's terrorists that way. They either don't hear it or worse. <laughs> The one guy that drove was the one that was in the building with the ambassador in smoke inhalation. So they picked the worst guy to drive. They go the wrong way. 
and they have a horrible vehicle ambush. If you guys see this on camera, it's way worse than the movies. Like, you think it was fake, it's like this car like putters up, it's got like no wheels anymore, and it's like all shot up. Um, again, if there was some sort of alerting system as they're pulling out, a GPS could be like, don't go this way. So another key thing that could have been fixed. Then, now, Everyone now moves over to the CIA annex, just so people are clear, because there are a lot of rumors about this. A lot of people are like, oh, people followed the State Department back, and then they got shot with mortars because of it. Um, so as I told you, Al-Qaeda went to go capture the US ambassador. A whole nother terrorist group shot the mortars at the CIA, and they knew where the CIA was where, to where that terrorist actually called it Bob's house. <laughs> So no one had to follow the CIA back to the annex to do a successful mortar strike because they knew exactly where it was. They knew where it was from the day it opened. But in real time, um, you know, all the rescue forces get on the CIA roofs because they're like, okay, we assume attacks are going to happen against us, and three more attacks end up happening that night. And then th this annoying drone comes back now. It's over the CIA annex, and it's like super close, right? And they're like, push off. Like, you should be looking for enemies. And so they send that to the drone. It never gets to the drone, as you can all imagine. They got weird feedback back from the drone with old info, but no one ever, through the phone game, sent push off and look for this. So again, if that would have been done right, um, this is kind of the one piece where we just make up a time. <laughs> so we, we say if that would have been done right, the drone could maybe have seen some of the enemy activity that um, of people setting up the mortars potentially, and then the analyst and station or whomever is working the tool, you know, could have put out um, the fact that the a mortar team's setting up and attacks occurring. Maybe it could have happened, maybe not, but it's just showing you all in real time, even when you get little tidbits of information, they need to be shared. You need to take advantage of them because it really can affect the timeline as we saw. There's delays just because information wasn't shared properly. And the thing was is, while the consulate was still open, that the diplomatic security agent in there was sharing everything. Like he is like your dream man in a crisis, right? So you had the right guy in the right spot to share. Of course, when everyone moved the CIA compound, nothing got shared, and nobody knew it was going on. To where actually a lot of the, the Department of Defense had no idea the attacks were still even going on because the CIA wasn't sharing oh, we have continued attacks now in our annex. So there's a lot of failures in the sharing um, of attack information. And that's basically the overview. So here's my details. I work for the Department of Defense. This is my personal investigation with Boone, as I told you guys. That's why I can say whatever I want. <laughs> um, if you wanted to know about the platform we use, that was called Metis, and that's um, the CEO, Christian Johnson, in his email. And then, obviously, our book, you can get it at Amazon and Barnes & Noble. I did bring some, and I can maybe sell them in the back. I asked Jake if that's allowed or not. <laughs> um, but um, if you're interested, let me know, and I'll be here. And if you have any questions, I can, I'm happy to answer any questions about Benghazi. Um, we've identified over 125 of the terrorists. There's over 150 terrorists just at the consulate alone. And then there's a 10-man mortar team that did the CIA um, mortar strike. So for the 10-man mortar team, we've, we've just identified the first member of that team, so that's the focus of our investigation right now. But our plan is to, we, we think it'll take five more years, but we're going to identify every single terrorist that were at the attacks that, that night because our government didn't do it, so someone had to. Thank you.